pleasure on behalf of the Graduate School uh, to introduce Harris Papadopoulos, who will be presenting today for the Krogos Graduate Student Lecture Series. Um, as you can see, his title is Looking at Bits and Bites, the History of Virtual Reality, and um, I know we are thrilled to have him as a recipient this year. And uh, without further ado, uh, one of his committee members, Demetrius uh, Samaras, will introduce him now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be introducing uh, Harris uh, to you today. A uh, couple of things about uh, Harris. He is in his fourth uh, year in uh, the computer science uh, PhD program. Before that, he did his um, uh, bachelor's in uh, the University of Informatics and Business uh, in Athens. Uh, he's been with us since 2009. Uh, I would say that uh, he's one of those students that, apart from uh, their scientific uh, merit, is actually really good at building things, getting, uh, uh, getting things to go, getting things to work for those of us who are in the uh, engineering uh, and hard sciences, we know that these students are uh, uh, rare. And one of uh, Harris's uh, achievement together with his uh, fellow students is that they have put uh, together a unique uh, resource for uh, our university and for the scientific community in general, and that is the reality uh, deck. It is uh, a large room uh, with uh, and, uh, with a lot of screens around, so we can actually show about uh, a billion and a half of uh, pixels at the same time. Uh, as far as I know, at the time that this was being built, this was the largest uh, facility of its kind. I'm not sure if it has been survived. Is it still? It is still. Is. It is still is the, it is the largest uh, facility of its kind. And, uh, now it's uh, up and running at uh, CIWIT. Uh, Harris was one of the students that worked really hard to, uh, to make this happen. And now he is poised to put out some great results on uh, how we can interact with such a large amount of data. That is something that we couldn't do before. So we actually don't know uh, what the right user interface is. And Harris has been um, uh, working on uh, uh, on this in the last year since the reality deck has been uh, operational. So without uh, further ado, I will introduce Harris and he will tell us about the exciting news. Thank you, Dante and Professor Samaras for the introduction. Uh, one more time, my name is Harris Papadopoulos. I am a uh, fourth year PhD candidate and a research assistant for the Center for Visual Computing in the Department of Computer Science. The title of my presentation is Looking at Bits and Bytes, A History of Virtual Reality. And just to take a brief look at the outline, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of virtual reality and some of the key uh, components that define virtual reality systems. We're going to look at different virtual reality platforms and how, they, and how they're implemented, what their hardware design is. And then we're going to talk about some very recent work that we've been doing on virtual reality here at Stony Brook University. We're going to talk about the facility that Professor Samaras mentioned, the Reality Deck, which is a very, very unique and um, which is a very, very unique system. We're going to talk about some of the applications that we have developed on the Reality Deck and some of the research directions that having access to such a unique facility allow us. And at the end of the talk, if you are willing to stick around, we can give you a brief demo, a brief virtual reality demo. I've brought a virtual reality headset with me. Now, we couldn't bring the reality deck here. It's a million and a half dollar facility. So we'll have to make do with uh, this uh, much more portable system. So just going, moving on to the introduction, what is the goal of virtual reality? This, the notion of virtual reality was most people would say that it was described by a prolific computer science and computer graphics researcher, uh, Ivan E. Sutherland, back in 1965. And he, he had this position paper called The Ultimate Display, where uh, he described this room that would offer maximum realism and saturate the human visual system. I'm going to read a quote out of his paper. The ultimate display would be a room within which the computer can control the existence of matter. So I think uh, he was probably a Star Trek fan because he was describing the holodeck. But unfortunately, our friends over at the Simon Center in the physics department haven't come through for us yet. So we have to use other technologies, computer graphics and computer science technologies, to achieve the virtual reality goal. 
And there, you know, there is two aspects to achieving this goal. There is a hardware aspect, so what kind of display systems we use to project visual information to the user, what resolution do these display systems have and how they are arranged around the user, and also the kinds of computing resources that generate the visuals that the user is perceiving. Then there's also a software aspect. It's not really the focus of this talk. I could probably give another four graduate lecture series on virtual reality software and computer graphics in general. So we're gonna touch, it briefly, we're gonna touch on this briefly in the application section. Talking about virtual reality, there is really two main principles uh, to, that, that, that quantify the performance of virtual reality systems. The first one is visual acuity. And if you've been to an eye doctor, you've probably, uh, th that's, th that's the version of visual acuity that you're familiar with. You go to the optometrist for an eye exam and you get to see this very familiar letter chart here. These, the sizes of these letters are not random. They're actually uh, spaced, apart, th th they're spaced uh, in such a way that they project to one arc minute on the back of your retina at certain distances. Now one arc minute is also the special resolution of the photoreceptors that you have in the back of your retina that get stimulated by light and basically allow you to see. So when you go to the doctor and you start reading through the chart top to bottom, you get at a point where the letters will start getting fuzzy. At that point, the adjacent lines, so for instance you can consider this and this line of the F letter, start projecting, that their projections start overlapping in your retina and your visual system becomes saturated. You can't perceive any more visual information. And then the doctor will go over here to the side of the eye chart and he'll read a fraction for you. It's gonna be 20 over 20 or 20 over 34, etc. which basically means that you see at 20 feet what the average person sees at 34 feet. So this diagnosis would be that you're nearsighted, for example. Interestingly, visual acuity can also be used to quantify the visual information, the quality of the visual information that you get from a display. So displays have, uh, the, one way to characterize their fidelity is by the size of a pixel. Now, if you assume that this here is a screen, this is the size of a pixel P. And the user is standing at some distance D away from the display. So the pixel actually projects through the user's retina and onto the back of the retina where the photoreceptors are. And remember those photoreceptors have a certain special resolution. Now, I was told not to include math in this uh, presentation, but this, there's like one equation, this is it. Uh, one over arc tangent P over D, which basically gives you the visual acuity for a certain display. And it maps directly to uh, the, the fraction, the, the Snellen fraction that you get from an optometrist. So for a particular display, you can say that this display has a visual acuity of 20 over 34, which basically means that you perceive the graphics on this display as if you had 20 over 34 vision. So if the display is not high resolution enough, it's effectively making you nearsighted because it's not saturating your human visual system. And this is important in delivering uh, high quality visuals and achieving this illusion of virtual reality. Another important component of virtual reality is that of immersion. Basically the ability of a system to envelop the user with visual information. And it has two subcomponents. One is the field of view. Basically the amount of the visual angle that a user has that is filled by a single display. So if this is a display here and this user is, starting, is standing at a certain distance, his visual field, this display occupies some part of his visual field that is a factor of the size of the display and again also the distance of the user from the display. So to make this more relatable, picture the difference between a normal cinema and an IMAX cinema. Why do you pay five bucks more to go to an IMAX? It's because the screen is significantly bigger, so you get a much more immersive experience when you go to an IMAX theater. Another aspect of immersion is that of panorama. Basically, surrounding the user in visual information in such a way that he can explore it by turning his or her head. This would be more akin to what you could get, for instance, in a planetarium, where you can actually turn your head left and right to see more visual information. But this, the panorama aspect, for example, is not achieved in an IMAX theater because you only have one screen and that screen is in front of you. And if you turn your head, you're probably seeing the person next to you instead of more of the movie. So there is a large, there's been a large number of virtual reality platforms through the years that offer, uh, that try to optimize these two main parameters of visual acuity and immersion. And we're going to go through the history of them. The, probably the, in his pursuit of the ultimate display, Sutherland in 1969 created the first head-mounted display, which is a sledgehammer approach to virtual reality. What you do is you take two screens and you put them right in front of the user's eyes, really, really close, effectively offering them a good field of view 
uh, and uh, using this to surround them with information. Now, uh, these things that you see over here are actually cathode ray tubes from the original prototype in 1969. The technology has evolved significantly since then. So you can get uh, head-mounted displays that use uh, LCDs or newer systems use these organic LED displays that generate their own light and don't need backlighting. And what's interesting is that actually head-mounted displays, they've kind of, they had kind of fallen to the wayside in the 90s, but now they're coming back. I've actually brought uh, this system right here. This is the Oculus Rift. It's a head-mounted display that was released in 2013. And you can get a chance to try it later if you would like to stick around. So head-mounted displays, like all virtual reality systems, have pros and cons. And uh, these, these stem mainly from the fact that they isolate the user. When you put them on, you're no longer seeing the physical environment that is around you. And that's both good and bad. They can offer good immersion because again, they have the screens that are close to your eyes. You can have panorama because you can actually use different types of equipment to track which way the user is looking and regenerate the graphics as they're looking around. They can offer you stereoscopic 3D because you're generating separate images for each eye. Think about what you get when you're looking at, an, at a 3D television, for example. And the very recent systems, like this amount of display that we have here, are, very, are quite cheap. They're $300. However, um, there are other systems that isolate the user without offering good immersion. So there, is, there are systems that actually give you the illusion that you are looking at an IMAX screen, at a screen that's really far away, while isolating you from the physical environment. A side effect is that they offer low visual acuity. If you think back to the formula that we showed you, uh, visual acuity is a factor of the distance of the user from the display. So if you put a really small distance, the pixels are really close to the user's eyes and he can tell them apart. That's not a good user experience. It makes it, the head mounting displays make it hard for multiple people to work together because they can't really see each other. They're isolated into the virtual world. And you have various presence issues and issues with conflicting sensory information. So, the user doesn't know where he is in relation to the physical environment. If he wants to move around, he has the risk of running into a wall. So there's a bunch of shortcomings. And there was, uh, in the 90s, um, uh, the University of Illinois Chicago developed an alternative to head-mounted displays, uh, the CAVE, which is basically an arrangement of three or more displays that surround the user. Uh, so we have an illustration of the CAVE right here. You can see it's basically a, a six-wall arrangement and you have these projectors that are actually projecting onto these uh, glass wall surfaces. And the user walks in and he gets this illusion of being inside the virtual world while at the same time being able to see the, um, the physical constraints of the room that he's in. So systems, cave systems usually have from three to six walls that are either projected from the front or the back. And we have such a system actually here at Sony Brook University at Seawit and the Visualization Lab. You can see it down here. This is our immersive cabin, as we call it. So you can see it's got four wall surfaces, and it actually has a floor surface right down here, which is front projected by a set of projectors up here that reflect onto a mirror. We all, it also has a mechanized door, so this opening can actually close and give you the full 360 degree panoramic experience. Caves have, again, pros and cons. They have good immersion because you can put the user in there and he gets his full panorama and a wide field of view because the displays are really big. They are a collaborative system. You can put multiple people in there and they work together. And they, offer, they can offer better visual acuity than HMDs. However, they can get really expensive. You can pay $5 million for a 100 megapixel cave. That's 100 million pixels. And their visual acuity is not that great. For the $5 million system, this is the visual acuity graph right here. Um, so you can see that at the very, very center of the system, you get a visual acuity of roughly uh, 20 over 34, which means that even for a really, really expensive system, the user is effectively nearsighted when he's in there. Their visual system is not being saturated. So again, in the 90s, as somewhat of an answer to the visual acuity issues of virtual reality systems, um, uh, folks started experimenting with uh, tile display arrays or power walls. And the first one was created at Princeton using projectors. They would tile multiple projectors together to create a seamless image. But uh, most recently, systems use, usually use LCD displays because they're cheaper and they have a number of benefits that we'll talk about later. Modern power walls can actually get to really high resolutions. They can get up to 300 million pixels. Um, and they offer really good visual acuity, but you get low immersion because you, while you do have this very wide wall in front of you, you don't get any panorama. You look to the left, you look to the right, there is no visual information there for you to digest. 
And there's been a couple of interesting hybrid systems, so to speak. This is one of my favorites. It's called the Star Cave, and it's at the California Institute of Telecommunication and Technology. And they were trying to figure out ways to make a high-resolution cave system that's more cost-effective. So what they did is they made a cave that actually has five walls. You can only see the two over here in this picture. And each wall has three segments, one, two, three. So you can use smaller projectors that project into smaller segments to basically increase the overall resolution of the system. So this system actually uses 34 projectors to and costs roughly a million dollars to achieve the same visual acuity than what you would get from a five million dollar system before. So it was, it was quite cost effective. Another interesting system, and this is very recent, this is contemporary to the reality deck, is the Cave 2 that was created by the same folks that created the Cave 1. Um, but instead of using projectors, what they do, you'll see in this, in this photo, is they've taken um, why uh, they've taken high, large diagonal 3D displays and they've tiled them into a circular arrangement. So this is a, a mostly immersive system. They have this opening here on the back for entrance and exit. There's no mechanized door or anything like that. But the resolution is low because these monitors that they're using are targeted at the promotional industry. So you only get about 72 megapixels per eye and quite low visual acuity when you're close to the screens. So we were looking back in 2009 at the landscape of virtual reality systems. And we found that there was no system that actually offered 2020 acuity, like perfect vision to users in a substantial visualization area, like so to, so as to allow the users to walk around. It wouldn't be able to support a large number of users. If you start putting many users in a cave, what happens is some of them end up being closer to the displays and getting a suboptimal experience. And it also, you also start to get quite cozy with your collaborators because the space of a cave is not very large. Um, there was no system that could permit natural multi-scale visualization, basically allowing the user to walk away from a display to get the overall context of what he's looking at versus going close to the display to really look at the detail. And while offering a full panoramic experience and also breaking the gigapixel resolution barrier. Up until the reality deck, no other system offered a billion pixels worth of resolution. So in 2009, we started designing such a system and we actually, I think, Cal Petkov came up with the name. He's right back there in the audience. He, uh, we called it the Reality Deck. So we're going to, oops, we're going to discuss a bit some of the engineering and design considerations behind building this very unique virtual reality system. So we're looking for gigapixel resolution, as I mentioned, 2020 visual acuity for a large space, 360 degree panoramic experience with a large workspace and we had some budgetary constraints naturally. This was uh, financed by the National Science Foundation. And we looked at different display systems that we could use. So the main candidates are usually projectors and LCD displays and we also looked at some specialty systems. So projectors have one main benefit. You can actually tile multiples of them together and you can get a seamless image or near seamless. However, they have several disadvantages. They get hot because they have these really powerful light bulbs inside that you need to project the image. They're expensive, anywhere from four to six figures, depending on what kind of projector you get. And we would need a lot of them for a facility of the size that we were building. And they need regular maintenance because the light bulbs wear. You need to change them every 2,000 to 10,000 hours, depending on the projector. And they're also expensive there. It can be several hundred dollars each. And they need calibration. So every time you change a light bulb, you have to mechanically align all the projectors together to make sure that they tile correctly. LCD displays are cheap because they're commodity hardware. You can go to Best Buy and actually buy them. They offer high pixel densities and they're easier to align than projectors. They have bezels, but this is both good and bad. The bezels actually interrupt the image that you're generating but they can also hide small discontinuities in the tiling. So if you put two displays next to each other and they're not perfectly aligned, the bezel actually uh, masks that discontinuity, which can be helpful. Um, one of the main issues with commodity hardware is that manufacturers build hundreds of thousands of them at the same time and you get a lot of uh, inconsistencies in the manufacturing process that you need to account for when building the system. And we also looked at some specialty hardware. This thing that you see right here is a Christie Microtile, for example. It's a 12-inch display with very, very narrow bezels, but relatively low resolution. And these guys were really expensive, and they didn't offer the pixel densities that we wanted to give the user a 2020 visual acuity in a substantial space. So after months and months of testing, 
we selected a 27-inch Samsung monitor. This is a commercial monitor. You can go to Best Buy and buy it right now, roughly $800, if I recall correctly, with a high resolution, 2560 by 1440, uh, which offers you a 2020 visual acuity at approximately 31 inches. So at the distance that I'm sitting now from the display, from my laptop's display, the human visual system is saturated. We did extensive customization to it to reduce the bezel size. We'll talk about that in a second. And we're actually talking about manufacturing deficiencies. We had to manually unbox, test, and take pictures of more than 500 monitors and then sh ship roughly uh, one third of them back to the manufacturer for replacement. And this was a manual process. It took several months to complete and we had a lot of help on that from our undergraduate student population. So talking about the monitor customization, uh, this is the Samsung S27 850D as you get it out of the box. You see it's got it's actually interesting because it's, it has an asymmetrical bezel. The top bezel is actually smaller than the one in the bottom because we have all the on-screen display controls down there. So it wouldn't be a good fit for tiling. But if you actually take the plastic off, then you end up with all the electronics being uh, loose. And there is actually nothing to mount the monitor on then left in the back. So we, we fabricated these custom mounting plates that are attached to the monitor using industrial grade tape. And they serve as mounting points for basically all the electronics that the monitor uses. Uh, so you see right here, we actually mounted the on-screen display controls on the back as well. And the end result, after masking the monitor with uh, photographic tape, is this, uh, this black frame into the virtual world with no ornamentation or buttons or LEDs on it to distract the user. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because we're probably the only folks that have gone to this, uh, that have gone to all this trouble with building such a tile display system. Now we have these displays, we needed something to mount them on, so we created a 33 by 19 foot uh, frame, and you can see a photo of it right here, it uses 8020 aluminum, uh, and the monitor back plates that you saw in this slide actually attach to the columns of this frame directly. We had to laser align all of them in order to make sure that the, they are consistent across the facility. And the nice thing about this design is that it's modular, so you can go and you can replace very easily an individual monitor if it goes bad. A unique characteristic of our facility is that it's fully immersive, 360 degrees, four walls, and has a mechanized door. So there's a segment of five by three displays on the rear of the reality deck, and you, you can control it, you use it basically a garage opener. So you click a button and it closes and it gives you a completely seamless image on the real world. You get a full 360 degree panorama with no interruptions. So talking a bit about building this thing, took us a while. Uh, just to illustrate the scale, these are, uh, this is the lab space where the reality deck is hosted right here. And these are half the monitors that we had to go through in order to construct it. Um, and you can see here the frame uh, going up on the walls. Here you can see the mounting points for the aluminum brackets. Uh, and this is yours truly, I am doing something here, I'm not sure what it was. And you can see over here on the bottom we've actually started aligning the monitor slowly. And this is the, this is the mounting process basically, we would start by laser aligning the bottom of the reality deck and then building on top of that, ensuring that the monitors are consistent uh, all around the facility. So talking about the end result, uh, if you recall, this is the visual acuity graph of a $5 million K facility. Uh, this is actually situated in um, the King Abdullah's University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so visual acuity at the center, roughly 20 over 34. And these two, these two figures are to scale. So this is what the visual acuity looks in the reality deck. You have a huge visualization space, about 384 square feet, where the human visual system is saturated. So it really affords uh, a lot of uh, ability to the users to move around inside the facility, to walk up to the displays, to see things in detail, to, work, to walk backwards, to see the overall context. And we'll see how that works out in a number of the applications that we've developed in some of the research that we've been doing. Oh, and on the record, the reality deck costs $1 million, so we could build five of these for a single $5 million cave. Uh, some more information about the hardware. We were on a shoestring budget by the NSF, so to speak, so we had to be really efficient with our computing resources. Uh, 
We use hundreds of, display, hundreds of displays, but we only use 18 computers to drive them, which is really unique. No other facility in the world has done that. We actually, each one of these computers that you see here on this rack drives 24 displays, a very high display to node ratio. And these are really high-end machines. They have dual hex core CPUs, gigabytes of RAM, multiple networking. And interestingly, they're, they, these can get really loud. There's 18 of them. These are workstation grade. Uh, computers, they get really loud and they get really hot, so we've put them in an adjacent machine room. So we actually had to use fiber of the cables to connect them to the displays in the reality deck. I'm going to give you some numbers. We got 416 displays for the entire facility, 1.5 billion pixels. This is five times larger than the next largest tile display in the world. That's the uh, Stallion. The tile display at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, center that is approximately 300 megapixels, and that's just a single wall. We're completely immersive. We give 360-degree panorama to the user. And Professor Samara spoiled this number for me. I wanted it to be more <laughs> <laughs> impressive <laughs> when I, was I would bring it up. That's why it's bolded. Uh, again, 18 computers for the visualization cluster. A number that I really like to stress is that we use approximately 6.2 miles of cables just to connect the displays to the computers. We have 24 infrared tracking cameras, 24 speakers, and four subwoofers, so we can do positional audio inside the system. And we have a multi-touch pixel sense table in the middle of the room. It should be visible in some of the pictures later. Since we mentioned tracking, this is uh, a system that we, we've really been taking advantage of in our uh, recent research. So these guys right here are infrared tracking cameras. You see this ring around the lens is a bunch of infrared LEDs. So they project infrared light into the scene that's not visible to a camera or a human visual system. And it reflects off these little ball markers that you see here. So there's software that actually captures these images and can then figure out where different objects are within the reality deck space. So we can use these things to track Heads. Over here we have our Yankee hat with the, with the little markers attached on it. We can track hands or even the fingers of users inside the reality deck space. And we use those, uh, we use those uh, instruments for different types of interactions. So having talked about the hardware, I would like to go briefly over some of the a non-exhaustive list of applications that we've developed for the reality deck. So we have a gigapixel resolution display. A natural fit for it is gigapixel resolution data. And you'd be surprised how easy it is to get this kind of data um, uh, nowadays. You can go to actually this website called gigapan.org. If you have a smartphone, you can probably pull it up right now. And you can find thousands of gigapixel resolution images. So over here in this figure, we have a wide field of view photograph of the reality deck. You can see the front wall here, and then sections of the side walls are visible here. And it's a gigapixel photograph of uh, Dubai in 2008, when the entire city was under construction. So the nice thing is, the nice thing about this illustration is that it really shows how you can do multi-scale natural exploration in the reality deck. So you can stand back and see the overall context of the city. But then you can walk up to the displays and resolve individual people, construction workers. You can read the signs on the walls. You could even read license plates on cars. So this is a proof of concept of applications that this kind of facility can have in things like national security or surveillance. If you have a really high resolution camera giving you images in real time, you can very, very naturally explore them without getting tunnel vision because you're constantly zooming to inspect a very, very small section of it. Another nice side effect is that this is a panoramic image. So it was shot off the top of a building and has a very wide field of view. And it's really easy to pan, to scan through the panorama very naturally just by turning your head. Uh, another application that we've been developing is geographical information systems. This is an application area that requires visualizing really large amounts of high resolution data. So here we see a uh, topographical map. It's of the Mediterranean and we're doing a simple visual simulation of rising sea water levels. So if you're standing far away, you can see some of the impacts, but th this is Greece actually. Uh, the interesting thing is that elevation in Greece is actually relatively high, even near the coastlines. but um, so from far, so you can just walk up to the display and resolve the uh, the impact areas on the islands. If you could walk up to the display here, you would be able you would be able to see that the coastlines are actually impacted by um, uh, by this rise in seawater level. So this is just another illustration of the kind of uh, natural 
user interaction that the reality deck can afford. A uh, very recent application that we've been uh, working with, actually, Dr. Simons from the, uh, from the dental school is using this kind of super high resolution facility to do things like workflow training. So the dental school just acquired, a, just built a clean room environment, which is, um, uh, with, in, with which, you know, there, there's a process that the user has to undergo in order to enter that environment and be able to interact with the, uh, with the systems that are in it and actually work inside of it. But if you need to train, for example, large number of students, you would probably want to do a virtual training instead where you could scan the room as we've done here. We have a gigapixel resolution photograph of the room and add inter interactivity on top of that. So you can illustrate the functionings of the incubator machines right here or interaction with the microscope that's seen over here. And again, to illustrate the effect of the super high resolution of the facility, this is a view of the entire room. If you just walk up to the display, you can actually resolve the readings on, the, um, on this incubator panel. So, we having discussed some applications, and this is a non-exhaustive list. We have a lot more going on in biomedical visualization, architectural visualization, etc. Let's talk a bit about some core visualization research that we've been doing at the Center for Visual Computing. We looked at the unique aspects of the Reality Deck facility. One of them is gigapixel resolution, so we can do one-to-one -one mapping of super high resolution data. We have a very large workspace, remember 384 square feet that the user feels really encouraged to move within while maintaining 20-20 visual acuity and full horizontal immersion. Actually, once you close that mechanized door that I showed you, you get a continuous 360 degree viewing surface. So this is some work uh, that uh, uh, Cal spearheaded about a year ago, if I recall correctly. Uh, it's called the Infinite Canvas. And I'm going to explain this to you in words. I'm actually going to show you a video because if uh, just from, from the textual explanation, I think you're going to you, you'll assume that I'm pulling a magic trick. So what we're doing is we can track the user moving inside the facility and then dynamically remap the data so as to give the illusion of a continuous viewing surface, basically. Give him the feeling that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the viewing surface of the reality deck is effectively unlimited along a single dimension. So the, we create the illusion of an infinitely large canvas, hence the term infinite canvas. So I'm going to show you this video uh, uh, from one of our paper submissions. I just need to find my mouse pointer somewhere. Uh, so this is our lab mate, Jane Gutenko, and she's exploring uh, a gigapixel resolution image of the Milky Way galaxy. This is the glimpse MIP scale survey done with an infrared telescope. So this is several gigapixels, and it's actually several times larger than the reality deck. And you can see here, as she's exploring the data, she spots a landmark of interest, this cluster of stars right here. Uh, again, this was because of the fact that she can, she, her visual system is saturated and she can easily move around and see the data. And you'll see she'll then continue her exploration by turning slowly to the right. And we're actually tracking her as she's moving around inside the facility. And you'll soon see this discontinuity right here appearing behind her. As she's moving around, the data is basically re remapping in real time. So when she's done a 360 degree turn, she's actually looking at a new section of the data, but she hasn't realized that this remapping has occurred. And you'll see as she's turning back in the other way right now, the data slowly maps to the original view and she will be able to spot the landmark that was there at first, right here. So this is a very unique method. It's enabled by the fact that you have a super gigapixel resolution facility with a full 360 degree panorama. However, if you have a really long data set, you don't want the user to get nauseous by spinning around six times while, uh, while trying to move through the data. Uh, so, whoops, spoiler. So uh, we developed the navigation spiral, which is a summarization technique basically. We can take this really long continuous strip and actually map it in its entirety around the reality deck. So you'll see here, she's looking at a section of the data and the navigation spiral would trigger and you get several sections of the data visualized at the same time. So you can jump to a different section and then select to expand it and you've basically made a jump through space without having to rotate around several times. As we mentioned, users are really encouraged to walk around inside the reality deck in order to explore the data. So 
what we thought is, for the displays that are far away from the user, it doesn't really make sense to show the full resolution data. We can improve system performance by actually lowering, lo loading lower detail versions instead. So by uh, using a schematic illustration here, what we're doing is we're assuming that the user is at the center of the facility and the system has made a level of detail selection. It's actually, going, it's actually loading data that is um, eight times lower in resolution for the user. As the user walks to the front of the facility, you'll see we're loading progressively higher resolution data. The, in the red area, we actually load the original data that the user would use if we didn't use this level of detail method. And this remapping actually tracks a user as they're moving around within the reality deck. And we showed a video of this. Uh, this is the uh, Dubai data set that I showed you before. And you can maybe see me wearing that Yankees hat from the previous slide. And you'll see I'm, I'm, the inset illustrates this section of the screens right here. And you'll see that as I'm approaching that particular area, the data is slowly going to increase in resolution. Right here, we're going one level of detail higher. And as I am in front of the data, it reaches the sharpest level. And then as I'm walking back, it drops in resolution again. So the idea is that we want to, uh, the ulterior motive of this work is that we want to enable dynamic exploration of this super gigapixel resolution data that is also updating in real time. So we don't have it locally. We may need to stream it over the internet. It may be video that's coming in from you know, a drone or a surveillance system. So we want to be able to cover the entirety of the reality deck, give the user a gigapixel resolution visualization experience while only streaming the bare minimum amount of visual information. And these were some research directions. Uh, Non-exhaustive list again, we could go on for much, for much longer. But before closing, I would like to acknowledge some people. First of all, my advisor and uh, distinguished professor of computer science and chair of the computer science department, Ari Kaufman. Unfortunately, he could not be here today. Professor Dimitri Samaras and Professor Klaus Mueller, they are both members of my committee and have offered very valuable input in the, during the process of creating and designing this facility. A very special acknowledgement to Cal Petko, he's right there in the back of the room. I don't want to lace him because I may blind him accidentally, but he's, uh, he's probably the main brain behind the reality, the, behind the software engineering and the design and construction of it. And he's also graduating soon, so he deserves, I think, a round of applause just for that. Uh, And finally, Ken Gladke, he's the Director of Operations for the Computer Science Department, and he's offered very, very valuable technical support and a lot of manual labor as well. Hooking up 416 displays doesn't happen on its own, so he's been a great help in this. And uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge the National Science Foundation that has funded the construction of this very unique facility through their major, major research instrumentation project. And just a small plug, we're always looking for big data to visualize in this kind of facility. So if you in your research are dealing with, for example, geospatial information data, astronomy data, or anything that you think would benefit from such a high resolution display, my email is right here, and you can talk to me right after the talk. We would really, we would really like to hear from you. And with that, I will conclude my talk and answer any questions. Thank you. <laughs>